A British, Canadian, Nigerian outer space lawyer walks into a bar. <laughs> no, that's not the beginning of a joke. That was me last night. Today, as a professor of space and society at the School for the Future of Innovation and Society, I think about the future of space exploration. Who are the participants in these futures? Who benefits from alternate futures? And is it even possible to prevent future conflicts in these futures? Take for a minute to think in your mind's eye what you see when I say the words space and society. The images that come to mind for me, the Earthrise picture taken by William Anders, 24th of December, 1968, and the, landing of, and the planting of the US flag by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, 20th of July, 1969. These two images revolutionized our relationship with space and Earth. The Earthrise picture gave us an opportunity for the first time to understand the fragility of Earth. And this picture is even attributed to starting the environmental movement. And of course, the landing on the moon. We saw that we can achieve the unachievable. These events are remembered with wonder and awe. These were amazing achievements, the achievements of men, of white men. And we remember these events with wonder and pride. But these memories mask the divergent viewpoints that actually were felt at the time and the fear that such displays of power elicited. So what are some of those diverging viewpoints? So Richard Nelson famously talked about the you know, um, uneven technological advancement that we have in society. And he coined the, ghetto, the moon and the ghetto metaphor. So on the one hand, we're able to achieve these amazing feats of technological advancement, yet the basic ills of society we can't address. Affordable health care, um, transportation systems that are for, mass, for the mass public, or even schools in the inner cities. That leaves a question for me, do we have to fix the basic ills of society before we can engage in fanciful things such as space exploration? For me, the basic answer is no. I don't think that we can address our problems in silos one, one at a time. So I don't think that we have to solve poverty and you know, world hunger before we invest in the future. And it seems that many countries in the world agree. So in this chart here by consultancy Euroconsult, these bubbles here represent countries and we can see here 65 countries that spend between 10 million and 35 billion annually on government space programs. And the interesting thing is that the global budget there we can see was $62.2 billion in 2016. That sounds like a lot of money, but it's not if we put it into context. In that same year, the Rio Olympics had a price tag of $15 billion. That's 20% of the entire global space budget. So if people say we're spending a lot of money on space, we're not really spending that much. But what's really interesting here is that the size of the bubbles are relative spending between these states. So what we can see, no one outspends the US in blue, that big bubble in blue. And even their nearest counterparts, China, in green and Russia in yellow are nowhere near. And the red dotted line in the center is European spending. So no one outspends the US. But what's fascinating for me are these tiny bubbles, Bolivia, Angola, Azerbaijan. What is the case for space investment in these countries? I started my career as a lawyer at the Nigerian Space Research and Development Agency. Yes, Nigeria had a space agency, and this is what it looked like. But I've lived and worked on space governance research in four different countries. And what's really interesting is that for all countries, space programs essentially serve national interests, particularly security and socioeconomic development. 
And space policies have gradually evolved to go from the concept of scientific advancement towards development and even survival of the state. And just as first-tier countries saw space as an arena for superpower competition based on um, security issues, developing countries also feel exactly the same. And what developing country, history has taught developing countries is that if you're not there in the formative stages of change, if you're not there at the development of new systems and governance regimes that regulate all this, then you, will ne you may never catch up and the status quo remains. And people are often surprised to hear that in Africa we have over 14 countries with active space programs. And last month alone, the African Union announced the establishment of a regional Africa-wide space agency to implement the African space agenda. So what's really interesting is this is simply a reflection of the new and changing dynamics of space, what the European Space Agency call the Space 4.0 era. And in the Space 4.0 era, it's where we're moving from the preserve of a few governments to a multi-stakeholder, diverse environment where we have billionaires and private industries such as SpaceX by Elon Musk or Amazon's um, Blue Origin to even the entrance of universities as big players. So you guys might know about the recent $500 million mission, Psyche mission that ASU won. So what's really interesting is when you look at, say, Space 2.0 era, which was the space race in Apollo, and compare that to the lunar activity of today in the Space 4.0 era, you really understand the changing dynamics. So let me give you a few examples. In 2008, India shocked the world by launching the Chandra-1 mission, a lunar probe for $54 million. That Basically, I'll tell you why that shocked everyone, because an equivalent mission by NASA would have cost $500 million. And so they were able to do such an amazing feat of technology for 10% of our costs. Another example, in, 20, in January 2019, China landed a rover on the far side of the moon, which is very complex technologically. They grew and planted seeds there. They plan to go back and build a research station, and by 2036 to have permanent settlement on the moon. And a month later, an Israeli company became the first private company to attempt to launch a lander to, uh, to, launch a lander to ro land on the moon. So what we see is that there's a real change from that first 2.0 era. And the issue becomes with all this diversity, is there an increased risk of conflict, particularly if our global governance regimes are not adequately suited for this new multi-stakeholder environment. So what are some of the challenges that could lead to conflict? Firstly, the dominant narratives today have changed. So in 2018, the national security strategy of the US stated that adversaries have made space into a war-fighting domain, and the US response must be dominance in space. Is that an escalatory action, or is it simply just a statement of the way things are now? We're currently waiting for a congressional decision about the proposed the directive from the president for a new space force, the sixth arm of the military, to protect space assets. Now, is this simply an administrative reshuffle? What are the operational implications of this? Or did we just get a new Netflix series out of it? Like, how many people here have seen The Office? So you guys know that Stephen Carell will be like the best commander of the Space Force. <laughs> On a more serious note, could the development of counter space capabilities by a few key actors be a threat to all stakeholders? Now, this may be a question for the big players like Russia and the US and China, but really, if space is seen as a contested environment, is that a threat for all actors? The big problem that we have is that it's difficult, the, the, the intent and purpose of space activities are sometimes unclear, which leads to uncertainty that can further exasperate the tensions that geopolitical rivals face. And according to the United Nations Institute on Disarmament Research, 
The problem becomes that it's difficult to distinguish between aggressive and defensive actions in space. So misperception is a clear and present danger. Also, with all this multi-stakeholderism and all these new actors, how do we address the issue of increasing space junk, space debris floating around in space? We already have issues of environmentalism and with, the, with trying to deal with the environmental problem, as we heard about plastics. Then what happens in the space environment? Another, another potential area is what happens when and if we finally find resources in space. So that NASA mission that ASU just won, that basically is going to an asteroid to look for me uh, metals. What if we find precious metals? What if we find water on the moon? How are we going to deal with what we do with that and how we share that and who has ownership rights and all those kind of issues? So these are some of the, the, uh, you know, some of the issues and the, and the questions that we face. And Dr. Namrata Goswani has actually warned us that we should be looking at areas like the South China Sea, Antarctica, and the claims of states in these areas to give us a purview of what could happen if we do find resources in space. So we're at TED, and I've talked about the problems, but it's about solutions. But how can I stand here and tell you what is the solution to stop conflict in space? It's a pretty tall order. All I can do is just say a couple of thoughts. The first one is principle. We have to get better at how we communicate and articulate the benefits and value of space to the general public. And this is important because so long as the general public believe that space is just the purview of Star Trek fans, they won't really understand that this affects our everyday life. You can't use the ATM machines without satellite communications, you, without satellites. You can't you know, do your navigation for your GPS without vulnerable satellites. And secondly, we need to have truly inclusive space cooperation, international space cooperation. We need to be able to work together, um, and the International Space Station basically was a great start. But with the new infrastructure projects coming online, for instance, NASA's Lunar Gateway project, the interesting question is who's going to be invited to the table? Who are going to be the participants? And what are the participation mechanisms going to look like? And this is really important because we need to build trust and transparency. And which really leads me to the most important point. Increasing mutual trust and transparency between diverse space actors is our real big challenge, because like I said, it's difficult to tell the intent and actions of space. You know, if you, if you launch something into space, I mean, the distinction between launching a satellite and launching like a ballistic missile it's, it's a really close kind of call. So it's, it's, it's a really kind of complex thing. So we have to do more work to increase, to build this trust and transparency. And there have been some ideas, such as better articulating our space policies and our counter space strategies, um, ha having better consultation and notification procedures. But many actors believe that we can't really trust states to abide by these voluntary measures. So this very week, 25 countries are actually in a closed-door meeting at the United Nations with a, with a panel um, called the Group of Governmental Experts who are actually working on the foundation of a, what could be the basis of a treaty. A treaty is an international law instrument that could basically address the vulnerability of space. But the basic takeaway from this is, could there be an even more basic reason why we should care about preserving the space environment. I think that Joey Esrich and Ed Finn said it best. Space is not a void, but it is a canvas for the human imagination. So questions of politics and logistics are merely scaffolding for a deeper set of questions about who we are and who we want to become as a species. We explore the universe because we are curious not just about what we will find out, but what that knowledge will do to us and how we will grow to match our expanding action and understanding. So is this the purview of just the rich, the advanced, or the geopolitically strong? Surely not. Don't we all want to live in a world where we can ignite our imagination, spur our curiosity, and grow to match our understanding? 
We may not all agree that space exploration is the right goal to explore these desires, but what we can agree is there's something about space that intrigues society. Therefore, the future of global space governance should be about inclusivity and uniting us all towards the common goal of advancing the human endeavor. Thank you.